I got the arrow into the back of the van. It crashed against the side wall and some of the bulbs broke. Some more of them broke when I tossed the cradle in after it. With that done, I drove back up the rise, pausing at the top to look behind me. I had taken away the arrow and the cones. All that remained now was that big orange warning. Road closed. Use detour. There was a car coming. It occurred to me that if Dolan was early, it had all been for nothing. The goon driving would simply turn down the detour, leaving me to go mad out here in the desert. It was a Chevrolet. My heart slowed down, and I let out a long, shuddering breath. But there was no more time for nerves. I drove back to where I had parked to look at my camouflage job and park there again. I reached under the jumble of stuff in the back of the van and got out the jack. Grimly ignoring my screaming back, I jacked up the rear end of the van, loosened the lug nuts on the back tire they would see when, if, they came, and tossed it into the back of the van. More glass broke, and I would just have to hope that there had been no damage done to the tire. I didn't have a spare. I went back to the front of the van, got my old binoculars, and headed back down the detour. I passed it and got to the top of the next rise as fast as I could. A shambling trot was really all I could manage by this time. Once at the top, I trained my binoculars east. I had a three-mile field of vision and could see snatches of the road for two miles east of that. Six vehicles were currently on the way, strung out like random beads on a long string. The first car was a foreign car, Datsun or Subaru, I thought, less than a mile away. Beyond that was a pickup, and beyond the pickup was what looked like a Mustang. The others were just desert light flashing on chrome and glass. When the first car neared, it was a Subaru. I stood up and stuck my thumb out. I didn't expect a ride looking the way I did, and I wasn't disappointed. The expensively quaffed woman behind the wheel took one horrified glance and her face snapped shut like a fist. Then she was gone, down the hill and onto the detour. Get a bath, buddy, the driver of the pickup yelled at me a half minute later. The Mustang actually turned out to be an escort. It was followed by a Plymouth, the Plymouth by a Winnebago that sounded as if it were full of kids having a pillow fight. No sign of Dolan. I looked at my watch. 11.25 a.m. If he was going to show up, it ought to be very soon. This was prime time. The hands on my watch moved slowly around to 11.40, and there was still no sign of him. Only a late model Ford and a hearse as black as a rain cloud. He's not coming. He went by the interstate, or he flew. No, he'll come. He won't, though. You were afraid he'd smell you, and he did. That's why he changed his pattern. There was another twinkle of light on the chrome in the distance. This car was a big one, big enough to be a Cadillac. I lay on my belly, elbows propped in the grid of the shoulder, binoculars to my eyes. The car disappeared around a rise, re-emerged, slipped around another curve, and then came out again. It was a Cadillac, all right, but it wasn't gray. It was a deep mint green. What followed was the most agonizing thirty seconds of my life. Thirty seconds that seemed to last for thirty years. Part of me decided on the spot, completely and irrevocably, that Dolan had traded his old Cadillac for a new one. Certainly he had done this before, and although he had never traded for a green one before, there was certainly no law against it. The other half argued vehemently that Cadillacs were almost a dime a dozen on the highways and byways between Vegas and L.A., and the odds against the green caddy being Dolan's Cadillac were a hundred to one. Sweat ran down my eyes, blurring them, and I put the binoculars down. They weren't going to help me solve this one anyhow. By the time I was able to see the passengers, it would be too late. It's almost too late now. Go down there and dump the detour sign. You're going to miss him. Let me tell you what you're going to catch in your trap if you hide that sign now. Two rich old people going to L.A. to see their children and take their grandkids to Disneyland. Do it! It's him! It's the only chance you're going to have. That's right, the only chance, so don't blow it by catching the wrong people. It's stolen. It's not. Stop it, I moaned, holding my head. Stop it, stop it. I could hear the motor now. Dolan, the old people, the lady, the tiger, Dolan, the old Elizabeth, help me, I groaned. 
Darling, that man has never owned a green Cadillac in his life. He never would. Of course it's not him. The pain in my head cleared away. I was able to get to my feet and get my thumb out. It wasn't the old people, and it wasn't Dolan either. It was what looked like twelve Vegas Corines crowded in with one old boy who was wearing the biggest cowboy hat and the darkest Foster Grants I'd ever seen. One of the Corines mooned me as the green Cadillac went fishtailing onto the detour. Slowly, feeling entirely washed out, I raised the binoculars again and saw him coming. There was no mistaking that Cadillac as it came around the curve at the far end of my uninterrupted view of the road. It was as gray as the sky overhead, but it stood out with startling clarity against the dull brown rises of land the east. It was him, Dolan. My long moments of doubt and indecision seemed both remote and foolish in an instant. It was Dolan, and I didn't have to see that gray Cadillac to know it. I didn't know if he could smell me, but I could smell him. Knowing he was on the way made it easier to pick up my aching legs and run. I got back to the big detour sign and shoved it face down into the ditch. I shook a sand-colored piece of canvas over it, then pawed loose sand over its support posts. The overall effect wasn't as good as the fake strip of road, but I thought it would serve. Now I ran up the second rise where I had left the van, which was just another part of the picture now, a vehicle temporarily abandoned by the owner who had gone off somewhere, either to get a new tire or have an old one fixed. I got into the cab and stretched out across the seat, my heart thumping. Again, time seemed to stretch out. I lay there listening for the engine, and the sound didn't come, and didn't come, and didn't come. They turned off. He caught wind of you at the last moment anyway, or something looked hinky either to him or one of his men, and they turned off. I lay on the seat, my back throbbing in long, slow waves, my eyes squinched tightly shut as if that would somehow help me hear better. Was that an engine? No, just the wind, now blowing hard enough to drive an occasional sheet of sand against the side of the van. Not coming. Turned off or turned back, just the wind. Turned off or turned back. No, it was not just the wind. It was a motor. The sound of it was swelling, and a few seconds later, a vehicle, one single vehicle, rushed past me. I sat up and grabbed the wheel. I had to grab something. I stared out through the windshield, my eyes bulging, my tongue caught between my teeth. The gray Cadillac floated down the hill towards the flat stretch, doing fifty or maybe a little more. The brake lights never went on, not even at the end. They never saw it, never had so much as the slightest idea. What happened was this. All at once the Cadillac seemed to be driving through the road instead of on it. This illusion was so persuasive that I felt a moment of confused vertigo, even though I had created the illusion myself. Dolan's Cadillac was hubcap deep in Route 71, and then it was up to the door panels. A bizarre thought occurred to me. If the GM company made luxury submarines, this is what they would look like going down. I could hear the thin, snapping sounds as the struts supporting the canvas broke under the car. I could hear the sounds of canvas rippling and ripping. All of it happened in only three seconds, but they are three seconds I will remember my whole life. I had an impression of the Cadillac now running with only its roof and the top two or three inches of the polarized windows visible, and then there was the big toneless thud and the sound of breaking glass and crimping metal. A large puff of dust rose in the air, and the wind pulled it apart. I wanted to go down there. Wanted to go down right away. But first I had to put the detour to rights. I didn't want us to be interrupted. I got out of the van and went around to the back and pulled the tire back out. I put it on the wheel and tightened the six lug nuts as fast as I could, using only my fingers. I could do a more thorough job later. In the meantime, I only needed to back the van down to the place where the detour diverged from Highway 71. I jacked the bumper down and hurried back to the cab of the van at a limping run. I paused there for a moment, listening, head cocked. I could hear the wind. And... 
from the long rectangular hole in the road, the sound of someone shouting, or maybe screaming. Grinning, I got back in the van. I backed rapidly down the road, the van swinging drunkenly back and forth. I got out, opened the back doors, and put out the traffic cones again. I kept my ear cocked for approaching traffic, but the wind had gotten too strong to make that very worthwhile. By the time I heard an approaching vehicle, it would be practically on top of me. I started down into the ditch, tripped, landed on my prat, and slid to the bottom. I pushed away the sand-colored piece of canvas and dragged the big detour sign up to the top. I set it up again, then went back to the van, slammed the rear doors closed. I had no intention of trying to set the arrow sign up again. I drove back over the next rise, stopped in my old place just out of sight of the detour, got out and tightened the lug nuts on the van's back wheel, using the tire iron this time. The shouting had stopped, but there was no longer any question about the screaming. It was much louder. I took my time tightening the nuts. I wasn't worried that they were going to get out and either attack me or run away into the desert because they couldn't get out. The trap had worked perfectly. The Cadillac was now sitting squarely on its wheels at the far end of the excavation, with less than four inches of clearance on either side. The three men inside couldn't open their doors wide enough to do more than stick a foot out, if that. They couldn't open their windows because they were power drive, and the battery would be so much squashed plastic and metal and acid somewhere in the wreck of the engine. The driver and the man in the shotgun seat might also be squashed in the wreckage, but this did not concern me. I knew that someone was still alive in there, just as I knew that Dolan always rode in the back and wore his seatbelt, as good citizens are supposed to do. The lug nuts tightened to my satisfaction. I drove the van down to the wide, shallow end of the trap and got out. Most of the struts were completely gone, but I could see the splintered butt ends of a few still sticking out of the tar. The canvas road lay at the bottom of the cut, crumpled and ripped and twisted. It looked like a shed snakeskin. I walked up to the deep end, and here was Dolan's Cadillac. The front end was utterly trashed, the hood had accordioned upward in a jagged fan shape. The engine compartment was a jumble of metal and rubber and hoses, all of it covered with sand and dirt that had avalanched down in the wake of the impact. There was a hissing sound, and I could hear fluids running and dripping down there someplace. The chilly alcohol aroma of antifreeze was pungent in the air. I had been worried about the windshield. There was always a chance it could have broken inward, allowing Dolan space enough to wriggle up and out. But I hadn't been too worried. I told you that Dolan's cars were built to the sorts of specifications required by tin-pot dictators and despotic military leaders. The glass was not supposed to break, and it had not. The caddy's rear window was even tougher because its area was smaller. Dolan couldn't break it, not in the time I was going to give him, certainly. He would not dare try to shoot it out. Shooting at bulletproof glass from up close is another form of Russian roulette. The slug would leave only a small white fleck on the glass and then ricochet back into the car. I'm sure he could have found an out, given world enough and time, but I was here now, and I would give him neither. I kicked a shower of dirt across the Cadillac's roof. The response was immediate. We need some help, please. We're stuck in here. Dolan's voice. He sounded unhurt and eerily calm. But I sensed the fear underneath, held rigidly in check, and I came as close to feeling sorry for him right then as it was possible for me to come. I could imagine him sitting in the back seat of his telescoped Cadillac, one of his men injured and moaning, probably pinned by the engine block, the other either dead or unconscious. I imagined it and felt a jittery moment of what I can only term sympathetic claustrophobia. Push the window buttons, nothing. Try the doors, even though you can see they're going to clunk to a full stop long before you could squeeze through. Then I stopped trying to imagine, because he was the one who had bought this, wasn't he? Yes. He had bought his own ticket and paid full fare. Who's there? Me, I said, but I'm not the help you're looking for, Dolan. I kicked another fan of grit and pebbles across the gray Cadillac's roof. 
The screamer started doing his thing again as the second bunch of pebbles rattled across the roof. My legs! Jim! My legs! Dolan's voice was suddenly wary. The man outside, the man on the top, knew his name, which meant this was an extremely dangerous situation. Jimmy, I can see the bones in my legs! Shut up, Dolan said coldly. It was eerie to hear their voices drifting up like that. I suppose I could have climbed down onto the Cadillac's back deck and looked in the rear window, but I would not have seen much even with my face pressed right against it. The glass was polarized, as I may have already told you. I didn't want to see him anyway. I knew what he looked like. What would I want to see him for? To find out if he was wearing his Rolex and his designer jeans? Who are you, buddy? He asked. I'm nobody, I said. Just a nobody who has a good reason to put you where you are right now. And with an eerie, frightening suddenness, Dolan said, Is your name Robinson? I felt as if someone had punched me in the stomach. He had made the connection that fast, winnowing through all the half-remembered names and faces and coming up with exactly the right one. Had I thought him an animal with the instincts of an animal? I hadn't known the half of it, and it was really just as well that I had not, or I never would have had the guts to do what I had done. I said, My name doesn't matter, but you know what happens now, don't you? The screamer began again, great bubbling liquid bellows. Get me out of here, Jimmy! Get me out of here! For the love of Jesus! Oh, my legs broke! Shut up, Dolan said, and then to me. I, I can't hear you, man, the way he's screaming. I got down on my hands and knees and leaned over. I said, you know what? I suddenly had an image of the wolf dressed up as Grandma, telling Red Riding Hood, All the better to hear you with, my dear. Come a little closer. I recoiled, and just in time, the revolver went off four times. The shots were loud where I was. They must have been deafening in the car. Four black eyes opened in the roof of Dolan's Cadillac, and I felt something split the air an inch from my forehead. Did I get you, cocksucker? Dolan asked. No, I said. The screamer had become the weeper. He was in the front seat. I saw his hands, as pale as the hands of a drowned man slapping weakly at the windshield and the slumped body next to him. Jimmy had to get him out. He was bleeding. The pain was bad. The pain was terrible. The pain was more than he could take. For the love of Jesus, he was sorry, heartily sorry for his sins, but this was more than... There was another pair of loud reports. The man in the front seat stopped screaming. The hands dropped away from the windshield. There... Dolan said in a voice that was almost reflective. He ain't hurting anymore, and we can hear what we say to each other. I said nothing. I felt suddenly dazed and unreal. He had killed a man just now. Killed him. The feeling that I had underestimated him in spite of all of my precautions and was lucky to be alive recurred. I want to make you a proposal, Dolan said. I continued to hold my peace. My friend. And to hold it some more. Hey! You! His voice trembled minutely. If you're still up there, talk to me. What can that hurt? I'm here, I said. I was just thinking you fired six times. I was thinking you may wish you'd saved one for yourself before long. Oh, but maybe there's eight in the clip, or you have reloads. Now it was his turn to fall silent. Then, what are you planning? I think you've already guessed, I said. I have spent the last 36 hours digging the world's longest grave, and now I'm going to bury you in your fucking Cadillac. The fear in his voice was still reined in. I wanted that rain to snap. You want to hear my proposition first? I'll listen in a few seconds. First, I have to get something. I walked back to the van and got my shovel. When I got back, he was saying, Robinson? 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 Like a man speaking into a dead phone. I'm here, I said. You talk. 
I'll listen, and when you're finished I may make a counterproposal. When he spoke he sounded more cheerful. If I was talking counterproposals I was talking deal, and if I was talking deal he was already halfway to being out. I'm offering you a million dollars to let me out of here, but just as important, I tossed a shovelful of gritty till down the rear deck of the Cadillac. Pebbles bounced and rattled off the small rear window. Dirt sifted into the line of the trunk lid. What are you doing? His voice was sharp with alarm. Idle hands do the devil's work, I said. I thought I'd keep mine busy while I listened. I dug into the dirt again and threw in another shovelful. Now Dolan spoke faster, his voice more urgent. A million dollars and my personal guarantee that no one will ever touch you. Not me, not my men, not anyone else's men. My hands didn't hurt anymore. It was amazing. I shoveled steadily and in no more than five minutes, the Cadillac's rear deck was drifted deep in dirt. Putting it in, even by hand, was certainly easier than taking it out. I paused, leaning on the shovel for a moment. Keep talking. Look, this is crazy, he said, and now I could hear bright splinters of panic in his voice. I mean, it's just crazy. You got that right, I said, and shoveled in more dirt. He held on longer than I thought any man could, talking, reasoning, cajoling, yet becoming more and more disjointed as the sand and dirt piled up over the rear window, repeating himself, backtracking, beginning to stutter. At one point, the passenger door opened as far as it could and banged into the sidewall of the excavation. I saw a hand with black hair on the knuckles and a big ruby ring on the second finger. I sent down a quick four shovelfuls of loose earth into the opening. He screamed curses and yanked the door shut again. He broke not long after. It was the sound of dirt coming down that finally got to him, I think. Sure it was. The sound would have been very loud inside the Cadillac. The dirt and stones rattling onto the roof and falling past the window. He must have finally realized he was sitting in an upholstered, eight-cylinder, fuel-injected coffin. Get me out! He shrieked. Please! I can't stand it! Get me out! You ready for that counterproposal? I asked. Yes. Yes. Jeez. Christ. Yes. 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 Scream. That's the counterproposal. That's what I want. Scream for me. If you scream loud enough, I'll let you out. <laughs>